I used to find that sometimes people just didn't get that I had autism. They thought that because I'm high functioning, that I can talk, that I can do my work, um, that I'm fine and that I'm not autistic. Autism spectrum condition is a developmental condition that impacts on a child's ability to communicate, the way that they relate to other people and also on their behaviour. The symptoms are really varied but they impact on three different areas. So um, in terms of communication skill, the, the child may be non-verbal, completely non-verbal, um, or may be highly articulate but have a tendency to talk at rather than with people, have limited conversational skill. In terms of social interaction, you have at the extreme end a child who doesn't show very much interest in people at all and prefers to be on their own and to engage in solitary activities. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are highly sociable but just have difficulty managing those relationships in the moment. Autism spectrum is not an illness. It's a neurodevelopmental condition. So you can think of it as a, a, a set of differences in the way that the brain processes information um, that results in some challenges in social communication, social interaction, in thinking flexibly and in um, reading other people's uh, non-verbal communication. They will also find it very, very difficult to express themselves with regards to their feelings and their emotions in social settings. So what we find is that they find their social side of conversing difficult. So when they're in, in interaction with others, they will misread often what's being said because they get very confused. But alongside that, they have what we class as repetitive uh, behaviours, that they are not, um, shall we say, characters of change. They like to stick to their routines, and they, are, they, they get very anxious and flustered if, they, if this has changed. So they do need what we class as predictability and order. Um, so we find that some families find that very difficult with their child if they're trying to change their environment, such as a transition from home to school, which can be problematic. It really varies because it occurs on a spectrum, but you have at one end, you have children who are non-verbal, who um, have little interest in relating to people and tend to repeat the same behaviours over and over. At the other end of the spectrum, you have highly articulate people who nonetheless communicate in a slightly different way. Um, experience sensory sensitivities that can make them feel very stressed and uncomfortable in the world. There were so many things that made me stressed. There was writing, there was spelling, and there's like, there were so many things, and it never came out because of an impression I wanted to get across. Um, and it did, and it always came out at home, which was annoying, and it, I hated it. Some small, stupid thing. Like maybe just laying the table or tidying up some toys and it would just make me go off. I've thrown chairs, I've messed up everything. I've barricaded my door so no one comes near me. A few weeks ago I was so annoyed at like some some little thing and I just, every, nothing was going so I opened my window and, and put my feet out ready to like go to the end and jump off and I was just like there's nothing to live for so I was li I was literally on the verge of jumping on my window like I had my feet there I was basically ready and I was like it's like you shouldn't have to you shouldn't do that over some small thing a lot of these difficulties are completely missed because the child has um, other skills that compensate so if they're bright children who are doing well in school then the teachers would often not even think that there might be an issue. Like, sometimes in a car and there's like tinted windows, you can't see through, and I felt like that was that was me at school. Like, you just couldn't see what was actually happening. And it was all like, it was all kind of just kept inside. Like, it can look good from the outside, but it can be scratched really badly in the in, on, on the inside. I was diagnosed age nine, so I was in about year, f yeah, year five at school. Um, I don't necessarily remember much about the process. I know, I mean, I joked that, that I 
probably got diagnosed and went back to playing Pokemon, you know. But um, I know that my mum and dad had to fight really hard for it because I kept coming across this barrier of like, oh, you know, she gets good grades. She gets good grades. That's all we're worried about. What's the problem? Everything else was the problem. Um, you know, I was obviously having the usual sort of difficulties socialising, quite frequent meltdowns because I guess at the time I didn't necessarily know what my triggers were, what my sensory differences were. But it kind of felt like, particularly from a school perspective, all they really cared about was the academics. I was told in the car, my parents told me, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I cried. And I don't know why I cried. I don't think it was because I was scared or anything. It's just because I didn't understand what it meant for me. Like, I thought, I was so overwhelmed, so scared. And when I thought, when I thought of the word autism when I was a kid, I think of the more classic cases or the more when you think of it like Sheldon Cooper, Sherlock Holmes, like that anti socially aware, very robotic male. And when I thought of that I was like, oh my god, am I like Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory? Am I am I like socially robotic? We used to believe that more boys were affected. We're realising now that many girls are affected, but were much better at masking it. So will have been possibly misdiagnosed with different mental health conditions um, and actually have autism at the source of their difficulties. A lot of the time as well, when a girl has autism, she has anxiety, which is a massive thing. And I think that's why people slip under the radar as well, because people think that a girl's anxiety, that um, autism is anxiety. That's what happened with me. Studies vary, but about 40% of people with autism live with a diagnosable level of anxiety. Um, and that might take the form of um, specific anxieties, or it might be more generalised. Obsessive compulsive disorder is uh, more common um, in autism um, alongside other mental health conditions. Some are always suffered with anxiety. Um, I knew that she was autistic from about the age of three, but it was obviously trying to get that recognition. So we had family counselling, um, which didn't really have much effect because obviously autism isn't um, a quick, you know, it's not an illness. It's, you can't have a quick fix for it. So, so then obviously we, nothing improved and so she went back when she was about seven and had some CBT and once again nothing really changed because it was kind of putting a plaster over an open wound almost and that didn't work and then she was finally diagnosed and it was kind of a relief actually because knowing that there's something wrong and not actually getting anyone to listen to you and thinking that you're, you're, you're seeing things or you're... you're you know, there's something wrong with your child, but no one would, you know, no one would listen to you. Is is when someone finally does, it's such a relief. If I'd had the diagnosis and people had thought about support beyond grades, they might have thought about, okay, what are your differences? Could you maybe sit somewhere else in the classroom that's less, that's you know, less noisy or things like that. Um, so again, it varies from person to person, but I think. It's really useful for other people to actually know what my difficulties are and it's really useful for me to know what my difficulties are. It helps those around the child to understand what they're finding difficult. So when they're behaving in a way that perhaps looks unusual, that that's interpreted not as just naughty behaviour um, or willful, disobedient, or this kind of perhaps more judgmental things that, that the uh, reasons underlying that behaviour are better understood. You know your child, so if you believe that, you know, there is something there that you is worth, you know, seeking, like a diagnosis or an EHCP, don't give up, keep pushing, because your child can't do it, so you have to do it for them and you will be told no, but it's just keep persevering because there is light at the end of the tunnel. How do we see this child developing in 10 years' time? How do we see that child progressing into an adult? So let's look at what we can put realistic into place to develop their social communication, social interaction, and social imagination, how they can be um, a, a, an adjusted social being in our society, but with recognition that they have 
their own individuality. I now work for Autistica, I'm in their policy team. We kind of take the, you know, the, the research that's going on that we're funding and kind of translate that into key sort of messages and briefings for decision makers and policy makers. In particular, I lead a new coalition that we launched in May called Embracing Complexity, which is a coalition of around 40 neurodevelopmental charities um, working together to think differently about people with neurodevelopmental conditions. Good afternoon, Autistica. George speaking. How can I help? So yeah, my job is kind of trying to keep all those charities in touch with each other and get in touch with new members and all of that, which is, um, yeah, I feel like I've, I've learned a lot from doing it and I'm really enjoying it. When I'm older, I'd like to stay on at school um, do maybe some A-levels and go to university, definitely. Um, I want to go to university and study drama and film. That's my dream. <laughs>